Good morning. Welcome, everyone, to the next Gen 4 International Forum uh, webinar. This presentation this morning is on supercritical water-cooled reactors. Um, the sound is broadcast over your computer speakers. There's the Q&A pod where you can type in uh, your questions for the, today's presenter, and we will take those at the end. Uh, again, the PDF version of the slide deck is in the files pod. You click on that and it will download to your computer. Um, and lastly, but probably most importantly, is the uh, survey for your um, feedback and helps us uh, improve the webinars and um, gives us information on, on uh, your thoughts and what you would like to see in the future as well. Doing today's introduction is Patricia Pavier. Patricia is the Director of the Office of Materials and Chemical Technologies, Office of Nuclear Energy, and she's also the Chair of the GIF Education and Training Task Force. Patricia. Thank you so much, Bertha. Good morning, everyone. It's my privilege to introduce Dr. Lawrence Lang from the Canadian Nuclear Laboratories today. Dr. Lang has been working at CNL, the formerly Chuck River Laboratories of Atomic Energy of Canada Limited since 1987 in the field of thermal hydraulics. He completed his PhD degree at the University of Ottawa, Canada in 1994. He's currently the manager of research and development facilities operation, and he's also responsible for the development of the Canadian supercritical water-cooled reactor concept. He received 13 awards from the Atomic Energy of Canada Limited AECL, an external organization, and delivered short courses on thermal hydraulics and supercritical water-cooled reactors. He is one of Canada's representatives to the GIVE supercritical water-cooled reactor system, and he is the co-chair of the System Steering Committee and the Thermal Hydraulics and Safety Project Management Board. So it's my pleasure to have you here, Dr. Long. And without any delay, I give you the floor. Thank you very much, Patricia. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the webinar. Uh, I'm, I'm providing this uh, presentation on behalf of the uh, FCWR System Steering Committee member. So uh, let's get going. Uh, let me see. OK, <clears throat> here's the outline of my the presentation or the talk. First, I will give you a, a brief historical development. You know, since the 1950s, we started the concept development already. And then give you the, the system design, the material, and the fuel, and uh, what is it, the configuration that we have right now for different concepts. And mention about the, some specific application other than the power generation. The status of the concept development at this point, and we have uh, s uh, several partners participating. Some of them are completing the, um, the the concept already, and others still working on on their concept. And one of the the area that uh, we are interested in is, is to uh, how the the SWR concept align with the chief technological. So there's a, a couple of the technological set out by the uh, Generation 4 International Forum for developing the advanced nuclear system. So we see how the SCWR match out to those uh, the technical goals. I will mention about the, uh, some of the challenges that we have, uh, we are facing right now, and some of them we have resolved, and other we are still working on that. And the majority of our work is the through the collaboration, either give or other uh, in the international organizations. So I will briefly talk about that. At the end, I'll give you a quick summary. So I think the, the first question that we always ask is, why supercritical water cool uh, reactor? I mean, we're looking at the, uh, the the landscape right now. Is you know the lot of advancement in technology between nuclear and fossil fuel power plant. And the SCWR actually is merging the, the two advanced uh, technology together. If you look at the system, I mean, it, it, we basically using the core for the nuclear system and the balance of plan for the fossil fuel power plant to come up with the SCWR concept. So this is a way that we can only focus on, we can only focus on the, I mean, we will only focus on the core uh, area 
and we don't have to worry about the balance of plan because we can simply take the, um, the balance supply concept for the advanced fossil fuel power plant. And you look at the, um, the landscape, is majority of utility, you know, providing uh, electricity or power, is actually operate both nuclear and supercritical fossil power plants. So it's much easier for them, for the utility to adopt the technology. And because that we have been, you know, working on both the nuclear and fossil fuel power plant for the past 50 years, we have many years of design and operating experience, so that will help us as a strong background to help us to move forward with the next generation of um, water cooled reactor. So the SCWL main feature is the main feature for the SCWL is high efficiency because we're operating at supercritical pressure and temperature at the core outlet. And you can see that in this in the in the right hand side is a Figure comparing the pressure and temperature with a different system. You have the BWL at the seven megapascal, the Candil pH the pressurized heavy water reactor at a ten megapascal, and the pressurized uh, water reactor at the fifteen megapascal, and the uh, SCWL is operate at the twenty five uh, megapascal. The temperature, the inner temperature, is varies a range between the pressure vessel type and the pressure tube type. So I will really go through over the, the different concept and the operating condition later on. So the increase of high e the efficiency is actually have a several advantage because you can use the same amount of fuel but generating uh, much uh, more power. So the power output is higher than the uh, other concept. And then because of high efficiency, you can reduce waste heat from the turbine and the condenser and that will help the environment. And because that you need less fuel, you can build less uh, fewer plant to meet the demand, and that will help us to save capital and the operating cost. And most of the, uh, I mean, the majority of the concept actually apply a simplification of the plant because we use a direct cycle. So the direct cycle allow us to pass the steam directly from the, the core to the turbine. I mean, we eliminating the, any heat exchanger, steam generator, or steam dryer, or moisture separator. Uh, we heat it in the other system. So that will help us to reduce the uh, capital and the operating cost as well. So the development of the SWR actually is very flexible. We can either have a thermal spectrum or fast spectrum uh, concept. And we can implement advanced fuel cycle. For example, the Canadian SWR implement the foreign fuel cycle by other system using the, uh, the uranium phase cycle, the fast reactor, actually the fast spectrum uh, reactor actually implement the MOX fuel cycle. And then it, it could definitely reduce the elect electricity uh, generating cost. And because of the high temperature and at the outlet, we can also have opportunity for cold generation as well. And those are the stuff that we will, we will talk about later on. So historically, you know, the, that's a proposed uh, SCWR concept since 1950 and 1960. And they have the Westinghouse supercritical uh, reactor concept. It's a thermal spectrum with a 70 megawatt thermal operating at pressure of 27.6 megapascal. The other one is a supercritical one through tube reactor, Scott R. And it's a big reactor operating uh, with a 2300 megawatt thermal and at the pressure of a 24 uh, megapascal. And we also have the General Electric Handful Supercritical Reactor with a 300 megawatt thermal at the 37.9 megapascal. The Backhouse and Wilcox Supercritical Fast Breeder Reactor proposed to generate 23, 26 megawatt thermal for operating at the pressure of 23.3 megapascal. So all those are concepts to be, you know, we, we don't have any uh, supercritical water cool reactor view or operator yet. But we do have a, a few superheated steam reactor the, uh, at, the, the temp at high temperature but a lower pressure. For example, in the Russian Federation, the Baloyev AMB 100 and AMB 200 reactor they will operate at a 510 degree superheat steam. And then the high dam 
reactor at 457 degrees C in Germany. So we do have some experience operating the reactor at high temperature, and, um, but not yet at the uh, supercritical pressure. So uh, since the 1960, and uh, the development of uh, SCWL concept have been dormant for quite a few years. And in 1990, it started with renewed interest, mainly because of the you know, environmental concern and try to re uh, reduce the greenhouse gas emission in the global env environment. And also that uh, we have a demand for the stable energy supply, especially for the developing country. And uh, because of the development uh, in the uh, supercritical um, turbine, and that's a potential for cost reduction. And usually that, you know, for nuclear, the fuel cost is lower, but the capital cost is higher uh, than the coal-fired power uh, plant. So is, by increasing the steam temperature, we can simplify the nuclear system. If, for example, we can use a direct cycle so that we can um, move the, um, in the steam or the trans pass the steam directly to the, uh, the turbine. And the advancement in the, the boiler in technology, you know, you can leverage the development in the fossil power industry, reducing the cost and risk, because we can simply adopt the, the balance of plan for the fossil power plant, and that will save us the development cost. And in the uh, fossil power plant, they actually, that can go up to, you know, achieving s almost 700 degrees in steam temperature and achieving the 50 degree, or 50% 50 uh, efficiency. So we're still not, not yet there, but I mean that we're approaching those uh, high um, temperature operations now. So the supercritical water cool reactor de concept development, I mean, we have uh, several partners uh, jointly uh, participate in developing the concept. And uh, Canada, the China, the European, Union, Japan, and the Russian Federation, and all five partners have signed the GIP SCWR system arrangement to jointly develop the concept. I mean, all the concept is actually evolved from the current uh, fleet of nuclear reactor. You see the pressure vessel type is the um, is evolved from the boiling water reactor or the pressurized water reactor. So it's similar. You have a pressure vessel with the core and the fuel is inside. And then if the, the steam is directly go to the, um, the, the turbine. And then you also have the pressure tube type. The pressure tube type is, for the core side, is quite similar to the, uh, the, the other concept. And, but except that the, 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 the core itself is separate into different fuel channel. And the, the steam is also gathered at the outlet uh, header and then pass the, uh, to the turbine directly. So you can see that you know, even within the core, that there's a lot of similarity between the uh, pressure vessel type and the pressure tube type. And based on that, we see that a lot of commonality that we can uh, have the research and development uh, working together to advance the technology. So I'm going to give you, you know, a number of uh, core, uh, the concept that uh, we have developed uh, so far. So as I mentioned before, that we have uh, the flexibility allow us to have a thermal spectrum or other spectrum or fast spectrum, and we even have a mixed spectrum uh, concept. So for the thermal spectrum, you see the. Um, Here's the, the Canadian, the Canada pressure tube type uh, SCWL core concept. And the core itself is separate into the, the top part. This is the inlet uh, plenum area. And then the, the flow is actually coming in from the, the whole, the, the, the liquid pipe, the water pipe, and get in into the core area and get into the fuel channel and then flow down in the middle pipe. I'll show you the detail later on. And then they take a reverse and passing through the, the fuel and then go into the outlet plenum in this area and then go directly through the steam pipe to the, uh, the turbine. The, the core itself is separate into the, like I said, the inner plenum. And then you have a low pressure uh, calendula, similar to the, um, 
pressurized heavy water reactor. So the, the, the moderator is a heavy water uh, sub, uh, separated from the coolant. The coolant is light water. And the, the, the rod, this is the control rod, and the shutdown rod is either come from the, right now is a reference, is come from the side, or you can either come from the bottom as well. And the second one is the China pressure vessel type, and this is a, uh, the, the core is similar to the, um, the PWR. The core itself, this is a fuel area, and then it's separate into the, the top part, the, the liquid coming in, the water coming in, and then going through the two parts, one part getting down, and then come back in the second part, and then go out to the, uh, the steam pipe, the, the turbine. The control rod and the shutdown rod come up from the top part and then introduce it into the core. And the European Union, the pressure vessel type uh, SCWR core concept is similar to the, um, the China pressure vessel type. It's also similar to the PWR. And the difference is the, the, this concept have a free pass system. So the, the water actually come in from the, from the top getting through the evaporator zone, and it'll go down to the bottom, come up from the evaporator zone in the core, and then get through down forward to the superheater uh, zone one, and then mix at the bottom, and then come out again uh, through the superheater uh, zone two, and then get out from the steam pipe to the turbine. The other thermal the spectrum is uh, Japan's uh, pressure vessel uh, type uh, SCWR. It's also a single pass system, it's similar to the, the BWR, and you can see that the core itself is in this area, and with all the fuel introduced in the middle, and the, the flow, actually the, the inner the water come in, and then separate the top part is cool down the, uh, the top part of the vessel, and the majority of the flow actually come down from to the bottom, and then mix it at the, bo at the dot, and then come up through the core, and then go outside to the steam pipe, and then to the um, to the turbine. So the control rod and shutdown rod actually come up from the bottom, similar to the BWR uh, configuration. So the other type of the spectral spectra, the core concept, the in the ch China and Shanghai Jiao Tong University actually developed a mixed core. So this uh, is a separate into two zones. This is a thermal zone, and then the, the flow actually comes up and then pass through the thermal zone in the downward flow, mix at the bottom, and then come, uh, goes up through the fast zone of the reactor and then get out from the, um, for the steam pipe to the turbine. And um, the second part is the Japan is a fast spectrum, SCWR, and then it's similar to the uh, uh, pressure vessel, uh, uh, PWR concept, the, the core itself is in this area, and the, is also separate in the blanket zone and the, the seat uh, field. And then I'll show you the core configuration later on. And then the flow is actually similar, there's a two-part system. So the one part going through the blanket, and then the other part goes through the seat uh, area. The Russian Federation is similar there as a pressure uh, vessel type, and then this is the core area, and is uh, also is a uh, two different concept. One is a single pass, and the other one is a two pass system as well. And they're still developing the uh, the concept. So similarly, that you have the, the water coming in from the core top, and then passing through. If it is a single pass, then it comes down, and then passing through the fuel in a single pass and get out in the, the core from the steam pipe. If it's a two-pass system, then some part of the flow will drop down, passing through the, uh, the first part and downward flow, and then the second pass come up uh, uh, through the, uh, the second pass and then go to the, the steam, uh, steam pipe. So all the core that you see, the, uh, the, the control rod uh, is actually come from the top and then going through the, the core region. So here's a, a, the diagram for the, uh, the core map. As I mentioned, the, the Canadian SCWR actually that have, uh, is a single pass system. So you have a free uh, batch refueling concept. So that's uh, the quarter uh, 
core map show you the how the refueling pattern. So the fuel coming in and the first burn in this area, and then after about one year is take out, move to the second area, and then burn for another year, and then take out, move to the third area, a year, a third zone, and then after the third burn they remove and then put into the um, the storage. The China, the thermal spectrum the core map, it has a separate in two zones. This is the uh, zone one, and this is a region that we have the uh, the downward flow and passing through the core region, and then after that, the mixing at the bottom of the, the core, and then come up with the second zone. And this is the outer zone that uh, with a second, um, the flow is coming up. And the EU is separate into the core, separate into three zones. So in the, the second, the middle one is called the evaporator zone, and that's the one that with an upward flow, when the flow comes down to the bottom, it travels to the top and through this area. And then the second is the red area, is a superheated one uh, zone. And then this is uh, the flow we travel downward and through the superheated zone one. And then mix at the more or less the bottom of the core and then come back out with the super superheated zone two, the yellow rich area, and then go out in the, the core. The Japan thermal spectrum, again, this is a, the single uh, path system. So it shows you that it, we, they adopt also the three uh, batch refueling system. So we show you the, uh, the, the first batch, the second batch, and the third uh, uh, batch refueling. And afterward, the fuel is uh, moved to storage again. <coughs> the, the China uh, mixed spectrum, the SCWR, so the, the thermal zone is the outer region, so the flow will come uh, going, moving downward through the, the zone one, the, the thermal spectrum region, and mix at the bottom, and then come up the, through the fast spectrum region. The Japan's fast spectrum, the, this is a, the core map, and the, the blue uh, area is the, the seat assembly. And then the, the gray area, the light gray area, is the blanket assembly. And the dark gray area is the reflector. So the, the, the water actually come, come in from the top and then go down to through the blanket uh, assembly and then come up through the seat assembly in this uh, area. The Russian Federation, they also have the fast spectrum uh, core. And the, the gray area is the one that without the um, with the control rod, the gray the zone is the, um, the assembly with the uh, control rod. And then the white area is the, the assembly without the, the control rod in, inserted. So you can see that there's a similarity between those two. So for the fuel concept, the <coughs> The can Canada, for the thermal spectrum, the Canada um, uh, pressure tube type, the fuel itself <coughs> is actually that the, the whole assembly in here is a fuel assembly. So the water actually come in from the top, go through the nozzle, acting as the orifice to control the, the, the flow rate going down to the, the channel, and then passing through a fuel nozzle coming down through the center, the water water pipe in this area, and then reverse the direction at the bottom of the fuel assembly, and then go moving up through the fuel rod itself. And then the fuel rod is have uh, two ring. It's a 32 rod in each ring, and the, the, the rod is separated by the wide web spacer in this case. So it's a fuel channel itself, it's only the pressure tube in this area. So after the one batch, the, the fuel assembly will be taken out and then move to another position. And then after the third batch, the, the fuel will completely take out and then move to the storage area. So the pressure tube itself, it doesn't move and does stay in the core. For the estimate is around 75 years that you can stay in the core. For the uh, China, the, Pressure vessel type, 
And one of the distinct uh, differences between the, this concept and the other is they use they putting a hole in the center of the fuel pallet, and then that will help to uh, to lower the uh, center line uh, temperature. And then the fuel is separate into two rings in, in this area. So it's a uh, outside is nine by nine uh, rod, and this one the diameter of the fuel is around 9.5 millimeters, similar to the PWR fuel. And then they also have a center, is a water box over in Desra. It's a five by five uh, area. And four assembly is grouped into a cluster. And then inside you have a crucible type of uh, control rod in between the, um, the, the fuel assembly. And the European Union uh, pressure vessel type fuel concept. <coughs> they actually, the uh, the concept itself is similar to what they have in in the um, in the other pressure vessel type. You can see this is a water box in in between, and then this is a the rod the assembly itself is seven by seven, and then with the center water box is a three by three. So this is one assembly, and then they also use a few the uh, uh, the wire wrap spacer uh, in, to, in between the fuel rods, and then the in the center that you have a water box, and then the, is separate so fuel from the water. The reason why they introduce the water box in the here is increase the moderation to the fuel in this area, and that will help to uh, new utilization. The, the fuel cluster is actually contained nine of this assembly and grouped together. And then they have uh, orifice in place at, the, at the, uh, the bottom or the top to adjust the, uh, the flow rate through the whole cluster. The Japan's thermal spectrum the pressure vessel type SWR fuel is, um, <coughs> is a big, uh, quite large uh, fuel assembly. The, it's a 16 by 16 rod assembly in this area, and they also they contain a water box, and the fuel itself have um, is a graded uh, uranium configuration at the different location. The bottom in here to show you this is actually the the graded and different location, and uh, uh, and then the the fuel assembly is around 5.8 meter. They also uh, Suggest use, they have a two different types, either the quick spacer or the uh, the wide web at this point that they still trying to select. So from the mixed spectrum, they separate the uh, the reactor in Dusong. So of course the fuel assembly will be also cover both the thermal zone and fast zone. So for the thermal zone, this is it is a fuel assembly. They also have uh, it's a single rod assembly in the outside and then two rods in the inside. So all the fuel assembly also contain water, water box in this area to help the moderation. And they also apply greater uranium uh, along the, the length, so region from seven at the lower end to, to six and five percent uh, enrichment to the top. And for the fast zone, you know, there's no they, they don't need moderation, so the fuel itself is compact into this area. And the fuel itself, they're using a wafer type of uh, configuration, so basically mix the blanket and the seat uh, area in the wafer form, so in, along the, the fuel rod. <coughs> so the Japan, the fast spectrum, they separate into the seat assembly and the, the blanket assembly. So the seat assembly, this is the area in the hexagonal type on configuration, and the white area is the fuel rod, and the dark and the black area is the control rod guide tube. So, and the the blanket area, the the fuel itself is the fuel rod that comprise that, and then outside you have a silicon silicon hydride layer as the um, the moderator in the blankets area. So the FAS, the Russian Federation FAS spectrum is also have a hexagonal type of fuel rod configuration. And <clears throat> the outside, those are the, the fuel rod without the uh, 
control rod, and then the dark to black circle is the one that with the control rod in place. And the field itself is also uh, configured into the um, like a cluster in this area. From the safety system, the majority of the, the concept is actually uh, very close to the ABWR or mixed with the ABWR as a ESBWR type. And the is all surrounded by a lot of water. For example, the Canada SCWR safety system, this is a core area, and this is a steam pipe connected to the turbine. And this is a gravity driven the suppression pool in this area. And then you have a research water pool at the top. The, the slight difference that from the Canada SWR concept is the safety system actually equipped with a separate um, passive moderator cooling system because the concept itself is separate the moderator from the coolant. So the uh, separate cooling system for the moderator is, is introduced to allow the, the heat to passing through the, um, from the fuel to the moderator and then to the moderator to the reserve water pool. And then the ultimate heating is actually the air cool. So there's a heat exchanger outside of the, um, the reactor building. And then the, the reserve water pool, the heat is transferred to the um, heat exchanger. And the outer ultimate heating is the air, ambient air. So as long as you have air, you continue cooling the, um, the reserve water pool. And then the China safety system is similar to the uh, ABWR, so you still they have the also the reserve water pool, and uh, the core is over here, and they have the automatically depressurizing system, and then the also the um, uh, ECC come in as well, the reserve water pool, and with the containment cooling system as well. And the EU safety system is similar, and then they, all of them are, are similar, actually, that you know, the core is over here, the uh, gravity-driven suppression pool on the side, and then those are the steam pipe and then the water pipe, and then connected to the reserve water pool. And this is the Japan safety system. The safety system itself for, for the Japan Japan's concept is, is the same for both the fast spectrum or the uh, the thermal spectrum. So in here, that this is a core area with a connection to the um, to the, the steam pipe and the liquid pipe, and those are the suppression pool, and also the reserve water pool is on top, and the automatically depressurizing system is connected into the um, outer system, and this is connected to the um, uh, also the bottom supply and the cooling system. And the <clears throat> again, the, this is the Russian the Federation SCWR safety system. There's the, is the two area that they're focusing on. The, this is the suppression pool, and then the reserve water pool. This is the core area. And they have also the containment uh, uh, cooling system for the, um, to reduce the pressure just in case in the accident scenario. So, but all of them are basically similar to the, like I said, the ABWR or ESBWR uh, config configuration. So, from the plan concept, you know, Japan, Canada, the EU, and Japan have completed the, the concept, and China and the Russian Federation are still working on their, their concept. So, is they are similar. To, you have the core, the containment, the this thing core, the containment, the reactor building, and then connecting it to the uh, balance of plant area. You have the high pressure and the, the medium pressure turbine and the low pressure turbine, and then connect to the generator. So the slightly different is the, in here, the Canadian concept, the, the high pressure and the, uh, in the medium pressure turbine also will be contained inside a containment in this area. And the rest of them is similar to the PWR. The EU concept is the same. You know, you have the core, the passing through the steam pipe to the high pressure turbine, the medium turb pressure turbine, and the low pressure turbine. And similarly for the Japan concept on the, the plant, and this is the core area connected to the turbine area. So I'll give you this is a, a summary of the key uh, SWR parameter. So you see that. 
Canada is the only pressure tip type, and the rest of them, China, EU, Japan, and Russian Federation are all pressure vessel type. And Canada, the, the thermal, the China have thermal and mix, EU are both thermal. Japan have thermal and fast, and Russian Federation have fast. The pressure is all the more or less the same, uh, except for the Russian Federation is uh, slightly lower uh, the pressure. In the temperature, <coughs> uh, the coolant but majority around 280 and 290. The Canada concept is uh, raises up to 350 uh, degrees in the temperature. Out of temperature, the Canada is up to 625 degrees. Is uh, matching the advanced uh, uh, high pressure turbine development in the fossil power plant. The rest of them is around uh, 500, 510, and the highest is uh, 560 for the Japan thermal spectrum uh, concept. Russian Federation also has a lot higher at 540. So the thermal power, <coughs> most of them is vary from 2300 up to 4000 type of 3800 uh, megawatt. Thermal, except for the Japan, the fast reactor, which is smaller at the 1600 megawatt. Efficiency, you know, because of the high temperature, outer temperature, the Canada concept of a higher efficiency around 48, the rest of them is around 40, 43 to 46 uh, percent uh, thermal efficiency. And the fuel itself, the majority use UO2, except for the fast uh, song that use MOX fuel. Canada use the uh, plutonium thorium as a reference fuel, but you can also use the UO2 or the or MOX fuel as well as a, as a fuel. The moderator, most of them are high, heavy, are light water uh, as, a, as a moderator. Canada thermal uh, spectrum concept is using the heavy water. And the Japan uh, fast, uh, the blanket side, they use the zirconia hydride as a moderator. The, um, the flow path, this is uh, some difference between the, each concept. Canada use a single path system. Canada, China use a two path uh, system. The EU use a three path uh, flow system. Japan have both either one or two path system, uh, similar to um, the fast spectrum and the uh, and the Russian Federation also have one or two path system concept option. So those are the um, the key the design parameter different between each concept. So we mentioned I mentioned about that you know the majority of the the function for the SCWR is for electric power generation, but because of the high temperature at the outlet, we can always use the uh, the steam from the outlet to for coal generation. For example, that we can use it for hydrogen production and. Uh, for oil extraction used through the steam assisted property drainage process or get the heat out for the desalinization process or using the heat for process heat. So those are the options that we can introduce into the SCWR and that will help also further improve the efficiency of the, um, the concept or the reactor. So from the concept Development status, <clears throat> the, as I mentioned, the Canada, EU, and Japan have completed the development of the concept. And after we finish the, the concept, we usually invite the international peer to review the, con review the concept and assess the viability. And uh, we've finished the, the, the development, but we still have some work uh, to be done. And we have uh, introduced uh, the R&D program to actually help us to improve the confidence on the concept itself. China and Russian Federation are working on completing the concept, and China also plan to hold a review of the concept with the international peer after the completion of their concept development. And one of the key uh, uh, area of interest is to perform a few irradiation tests. The reason why that, as I mentioned previously, that you know, we haven't actually developed a, or established an in-core SWR uh, facility uh, for operation or testing. So preparing for a few irrigation tests, that will give us 
the opportunity to acquire design and licensing experience for an in-reactor supercritical water cool system. So the test itself will provide us with in-reactor test data for fuel, for cladding material, and also thermal the efficiency as, uh, I mean thermal and hydraulic as well at the supercritical pressure. The data that we obtain can also be used for co-validation. And, you know, you, as I mentioned previously in the figure, the, <clears throat> the core uh, size is actually quite big. You know, the power generation from, uh, from 2300 up to uh, 4000 megawatt thermal, except for the super fast uh, reactor from the Japan, uh, Japan's concept then is, uh, have a lower uh, thermal power generation around 16 megawatt, 1600 megawatt um, thermal. But a lot of small remote reactive uh, community actually that require much less power than uh, 1000 megawatt. So, I mean, the flexibility of the SCWR concept allow us to adjust the core size to meet the, the need for the local deployment. We are also interested in developing the small SCWR concept or even very small SCWR concept varying from 10 megawatt up to 300 megawatt electricity to meet the local deployment needs. So this is uh, something that we're working, we start to work on right now. So from the cheap technology goals point of view, you know, the, uh, when they set up in the, in the beginning, they established several goals to achieve for the advanced nuclear system. The economic, for example, that we will try to reduce the capital and the operating cost for the advanced nuclear system to improve the safety and reliability. This will allow us to strengthen the public acceptance of the nuclear energy and help us in the sustainability. That means that we can reduce waste and improve the resource utilization and also to enhance the proliferation resistance and physical protection that will help us to strengthen the public confidence on the, uh, on the nuclear energy. So all this technology goal that we, we try to achieve in developing the concept. And but on top of it, we have to think about is how the, the, the concept have to be competitive to other power generation source and system in the local deployment area. So in the following uh, several uh, slides, I will show you how the, um, the SWL uh, align with the technological developed uh, by JIT. So for economic, you know, the JIT economic goal for the Gen 4 system is having a life cycle cost advantage over other energy systems. That, that means it's lower levelized unit cost of energy on average over the lifetime and also have a level of financial risk compatible to other energy projects, you know, similar total capital investment and capital as risk. So when we look at the cost, we we look at the capital cost, the fuel cost, operation and maintenance cost in the established the, in the comparison for the economic of different system. And where to evaluate the cost, we look at the total capital investment cost, TCIC, that is actually the uh, overnight capital cost plus the interest during the construction. So if you have five year construction, that means that you have to capture the investment plus the interest during that construction phase. And then we look at also the, what we call the levelized unit electricity or energy cost, LUEC. Generally, the, you know, when we look at the cost evaluation, because this is a new system, is an advanced system, there's a high degree of uncertainty surrounding the economic estimate for this kind of concept. So in many cases, we base on the, um, the current uh, knowledge on the, on the BWR or PWR system, and then apply you know, um, some um, quantification to assemble or the, the cost for the estimate. Because we have the SCWR have a high efficiency, and that means that you know we we need fewer plants for the for the same demand of uh, power or energy. So that in fact in fact is already reduced the capital or operating cost in general. So the 
pressure vessel type SCWR economic, actually that the, the EU SCWR concept, so you call it a high performance light water reactor, it has assessed the capital cost against the advanced boiling water reactor. And in here, <coughs> they follow the cheap economic assessment guidelines. And that's before that they, they actually that propose the, the, the model for use in the economic assessment. So here's the figure that is comparing the total overnight cost for the ABW plan, advanced, boil, advanced boiling water reactor plan, and the high performance light water reactor. They separate into different components in this area. And overall, what they find that the total overnight cost for the HBLWR is about 20% lower than the ABWR. They also look at the sensitivity of the capital and fuel costs on the electricity generation cost. And what they find is the capital cost variation basically affect the electricity generation cost, but only over for a short term. And then for the long run, it's diminished, and then the effect has become uh, less uh, significant. The fuel cost variation also affect the electricity generation cost over the depreciation period, and also the difference is um, reduced with time as well. So from the positive type SCWR, they, um, they, they also compare with the advanced boiling water reactor. And the information that they collect is from the Tennessee Valley Authority dollar funding site. And the cost that they provide and that for that site is actually presented in 2005. So after the um, 2011, I mean the, the Fukushima incident, then that a lot of safety systems have been introduced into the ABWR as well. So those costs haven't been included in the, uh, the calculation. So the, they apply actually the cheap economic modeling tool and including the uncertainty into the calculation. And what they find, you know, they compare the, the, total, the TCIAC or the total capital investment cost, and they find that the it is compatible with the advanced boiling water reactor and the level level I unit energy electricity cost actually is higher for the Canadian SCWR compared to the ABWR is mainly because of the, the fuel cost is higher. As I mentioned before, you know, the calculation, the uncertainty is very also very high. So this is a table that when they compare the Canadian SWR concept with the other system, including AB, uh, the ABWR and AP1000 and the summer AP1000 and FOCO. You can see that with the ABWR, it's a compatible 44 to 41. And then compared to AB1000, that is uh, slightly lower. The FOCO AP1000 is quoted in the reference, it's a bit low. And I think that they have revised the, the cost right now in the, uh, in the system. So the, for the LUEC, that's a comparison. Again, like I said, the SCWR is slightly higher than the ABWR, but it's also compatible with uh, other uh, quoted uh, price or LUEC. But I mean, the economic right now at this point is still in the concept level and could be also improved. For example, that if the um, <clears throat> if the SCW is used as a because it's using the plutonium thorium fuel, if you consider as a burner for the excess uh, plutonium, then that will improve the economic. Or you know because of the high temperature outlet, it can also include the cogeneration, co and that will also improve the economic as well. So those are the options that we can in introduce. From uh, safety and reliability, and the chief safety and reliability goal for the Gen4 system is excelled in safety and reliability, having a very low likelihood and degree of uh, reactor core damage or eliminate the need for off-site emergency uh, response. And the working group actually developed and what they call the integrated safety assessment methodology, and they introduced several tools and they, to to uh, assess the safety characteristics. 
the tool itself, the con these five different tools, and you can need to apply at a, in, at the maturity of the design of the concept. So the qualitative safety feature review or the QSR and phenomenal phenomena identification ranking table PERT, objective provision tree OPT, and then the probabilistic safety assessment PSA and deterministic and phenomenological analysis or DPA. So depend on the maturity of the design that you can apply in, in different tool in the assessment. So from the con at the concept phase, usually that you can apply the QSR per PSA and the deterministic uh, analysis. So the safety and reliability of the characteristic of the SCWR actually is quite similar to the current state of reactor. For example, the pressure vessel, vessel type SCWR is compatible to the pressurized or boiling water reactor. The pressure tube type is compatible with the pressurized the heavy water type of reactor. And the safety requirement is different between uh, this, the SCWR and the current fleet of reactor. The current fleet of reactor focus on maintaining the coolant inventory in the system, but the, um, the SCWR, we are focusing on the maintaining the coolant flow rate through the core because it's a direct cycle with no recirculation in the, uh, in the core. So the feed water flow rate is very important for, for the SCWR. So from the pressure vessel type, the Japan, the super light water reactor, they, they actually perform the safety analysis using deterministic analysis. They cover the key postulated accident scenario, and what they find is a 50% break of the loss of coolant accident is a limiting event for them. The peak cladding temperature in the measure that is around 1,000 degrees, that is a 350 degree above the steady state value. They also perform what is the simplified that probabilistic safety analysis. They quantify the core damage frequency is around 5 uh, to the E to the minus 7 for the large peak loss of coolant accident. The European Union also performed the safety analysis uh, for the high performance light water reactor. They applied the deterministic analysis, covered selected postulated accident scenario only. What they find is the total loss of feed water is a limiting event for the uh, HVLWR. The pre Peak cladding temperature predicted around 910 degrees Celsius. They also have to introduce a number of a passive safety system to enhance the, safe, enhance the safety characteristic of the high performance light water reactor. From the, uh, the pressure tube type SWR, they actually follow the uh, the gym methodology and they perform a qualitative safety feature review and covering five level of defense in that provision assessed it in the in the case. And they also perform a, a PERT, a phenomena the identification and ranking table. And in here, this is the, uh, the table that they can take a look at the, <coughs> the rank of importance, so the high, medium, and low, and in term, and the status of the knowledge from one to four. Four is a lot of vast knowledge, and then one is a lack of knowledge. So they identify 30 knowledge gap uh, among this uh, establishment, and the majority of the knowledge gap is related to new material used in the core. They expect the ceramic insulator that insulating the, uh, the, the high temperature coolant from the uh, low temperature uh, pressure tube and also the um, moderator. And they applied a deterministic analysis, cover or key a lot of uh, postulated accident scenario. And they find that the, the one that the coupling, coupled loss of coolant with loss of emergency core cooling accident is the most limiting cladding temperature event for this uh, concept. The peak cladding temperature predicted around 1175 is close to the limit, design limit. And also that, but it's still uh, below the, the melting temperature of the cladding. They also, they also perform a simplified probabilistic safety analysis and basically look at the, um, <coughs> the core damage frequency for 
several uh, possibly accident scenarios, small brake loca, large brake loca, and the loss of class 4 power. And they find that the probability of core damage is at least one order of magnitude uh, lower than other reactor systems. But like I said, this is a simplified system, and then this is still uh, have a lot of uncertainty and need to quantify. Sustainability, the GIPS uh, sustainability goal is to generate energy sustainability and promote long-term availability of nuclear fuel, and also minimize nuclear waste and reduce the long-term stewardship of burden. So at this point, the GIPS haven't developed uh, or established a common methodology for assessment as yet, and then we only based on the, the, the knowledge that we have and develop a sustainability matrix in the assessment. But in general, the nuclear energy actually is one of the lowest source of greenhouse gas uh, emitter, emitter and that's 20 to 30 times less than fossil fuel source, including natural gas. So in that case, that you know is actually that it generates energy, you know, with a minimal or the damage to the environment. And we apply sustainability matrix is meeting a clean air objective. I think usually that this is a nuclear system is always meeting this kind of objective. And we promote long-term availability of system, promote effective fuel utilization, or minimize and manage nuclear waste, and reduce the long-term situation of burden of nuclear waste, and also improve protection for the public health and the environment. And those are the metrics that we use to establish and to the um, uh, sustainability characteristic until they give, uh, come up with a common methodology. So because the SCWR, they have a high efficiency, like I said, mentioned before, it is increase the power output for the same amount of uh, fuel input. So in a reality that, you know, you reduce the, uh, the fuel utilization. And then you also reduce the waste heat from turbine and condenser, that means that it is good for the environment. And we got promote other effective fuel utilization, minimize nuclear waste on long-term availability system and environmental protection based on efficiency improvement. And the Canadian SCWR in, in implementing the advanced thermal, I mean, thorium fuel cycle is actually improved the sensibility because thorium is more abundant than uranium in the world. Then use of plutonium thorium fuel extending the natural uranium resource, so you don't need to add any uranium into the system anymore. And use of the thorium fuel produce a future use, usable fissile inventory of U233, so you can continue use the, um, the U233 replacing the, um, the plutonium and then use it as a, um, the bleeder to bleed the thorium. And also that in the lower the long-term gamma of, uh, of used nuclear fuel, and also reduce the amount and the decay power of the high-level fuel as well, using the based on the advanced thorium fuel cycle. So proliferation resistance and physical protection, and you look at that, the, the chip proliferation resistance and the physical protection goal is to be a very unattractive route for diversion or threat of a weapon usable material and provide increased physical protection against acts of terrorism. So this is the, uh, the cycle itself is from the fresh fuel coming in to the fresh fuel storage to the go through the reactor to the spent fuel storage and go to the shipping and receiving of the, of the spent, spent fuel. So the the methodology developed by GIF on the proliferation resistance and physical protection is actually to look into the proliferation resistance measure, also the physical protection measure. So we use those two measures to establish the characteristic for the SCWR. <coughs> so we identify the main threat the, for, the, um, for this uh, two, for the proliferation resistance threat is diversion of fresh and or spent fuel, and also conceal production. That means the misuse of the, um, the fuel or the spent fuel. From the physical protection set is a sabotage attempt to cause radiological release. Those are the two threats that uh, the threat that we identify. 
you look at the SCWR compared to the either BWR or, or PWR, the the SCWR actually have a very small footprint. It's smaller than uh, what the current fleet of reactor. So the smaller footprint actually can enhance the opportunity for physical protection because you know there's a less you know area to, to cover. So the most concern, most concept that we have uh, introduced are based on the familiar technology from a safeguard point of view. For example, that we use a thermal spectrum using batch refill, using solid fuel, using light water coolant. Those are, you know, is a familiar technology for the safeguard. It, can, can, if you use the, uh, the the forium, advanced forium fuel cycle is, is, uh, enhance also the characteristic on proliferation resistance and physical protection because the thorium is fertile, it's not fissile, and so it is lower plutonium production from the thorium. And the produce of a U233 and U238 together is very difficult to separate the two. And the spent fuel contains also deep burn of a plutonium and U233 mixed with U232. And the, the radioactive activity of the spent fuel is a barrier to diversion of the spent fuel assembly as well because of its high level. So I think that those are the key areas. So I covered the, um, the alignment with the chief technology goal for the SCWR. Now I will talk about you know, some of the design challenges we have uh, in developing the concept. I mean, because it's a high temperature, uh, high pressure reactor, one of the, um, the, the challenges is to get the material. For the in-core and outer core component, and then what we find is, is no single alloy or we, that have uh, sufficient information to confirm the performance for use in the SCWR uh, component. But we can adopt a lot of information or the experience for the current phase of reactor and the fossil fuel power plant. And we have to establish you know, different acceptance criteria or requirement for the corrosion on the nuclear power plant. And because of the high temperature uh, operating condition in the core, and we need probably a thermal or the corrosion resistant barrier to in component that have a very high temperature gradient. So one of the, the key area that we find is challenging is the cladding. Is the, because it's a high temperature operating condition, the zirconium based alloy that currently used in the uh, reactor is considered not a viable material. So the majority of the fuel concept actually adopt the stainless steel or nickel based alloy as their candidate. So to qualify those materials for use in, in the SWR, we have to demonstrate the performance in the key area. For, for example, in the corrosion and the uh, gas corrosion cracking, the strain and bitumen or creep resistance, and the change also in the dimension and the microstructure in the, in during the operation duration. But keep in mind that, you know, in many cases, the, the, the cladding still in the core over a very short time, and every year that we'll take it out and move the uh, the fuel into a different location, and then we have to you know uh, after three batches we'll take it out from the core, and on top of it you know we need to quantify the irradiation effect on this kind of uh, um, key technology area. So in this figure that we'll show you an uh, example that is the measure the weight gain for the single steel fix 16 and 316L at the supercritical SWR condition. Um, <clears throat> this is a function of uh, the waking as a function of uh, temperature in the, um, in the auto clay. So we vary from around 250 up to uh, 550 degree. You can see the weight gain that is simulating the, the corrosion characteristic is actually the increase quite fast when you go to a high temperature. So I mean, we can test it up to higher 550, but we still have the challenge at the testing at a higher pressure and high temperature. For example, that we don't have any autoclave that beyond the 700 degree uh, that can test the, the corrosion, those things. We, 
we started constructing the, the new loop that can withstand 850. So hopefully that we can get some data at a higher temperature. And we also need the, the uh, reactor or in reactor test for irradiation effect. And we are looking at the other effect, uh, the irradiation effect using the uh, accelerator as well. So hopefully we get uh, some information to quantify the impact of irradiation on those uh, key areas. You look at the, the SWR material selection, for example, this is the, the figure that shows you the, the, the complete core configuration, the core turbine, the low pressure, low temperature turbine, and the feed train area. So you look at the first the material selection in the low temperature area, and the feed train can be based on the BWR or the fossil fire power plant. And, but for the, uh, we may need uh, some optimization to minimize the impurity transport from the core through the turbine to this area. So the focus is actually that in the high, the core and the high temperature turbine area, because that's the area that outside the bound of the current OPEX. So we need to focus on those areas in develop in a savage material candidate. So we use and different uh, uh, methodology to establish the, to rank the different material for, for collecting material. And we look at five different uh, material in this area, alloy 800H, single steel 310S, 625, 347, 210, and look at the property. For example, corrosion, oxide thickness, creep, the ductility and strain. So we establish the, the different at this property for ensemble corrosion, we see that we have uh, available data that this alloy will meet the corrosion criteria. The <clears throat> orange area in this area, that means that we have some data uh, or available that may or may not meet the performance. And the red area, that means that we have data to show that the alloy will not meet the performance criteria. The gray area is the area that we find that we don't have sufficient data to, uh, to quantify the, um, the effect or the, on this property or this um, uh, cladding material. So if you look at overall, I mean, <clears throat> the alloy 800H, you know, for the utility, none of the, uh, the alloy and seem to have a sufficient data to cover the utility uh, property. But so you can see the alloy 800H and the 625 seems to be the best uh, with the sufficient information to justify as a good uh, cladding material candidate. So I mentioned about the corrosion test at the high temperature is one of the issue. And we are looking also to, to find out whether we can use a, a low pressure uh, superheated steam as a surrogate condition to test at high temperature, high pressure. So they performed them corrosion tests at the alternatic uh, thickness steel, 310, 304, and the nickel uh, iron base A286. They performed the test at uh, um, still upon 1 megapascal, 8 megapascal, and 29 megapascal at the 625 degrees Celsius for 1,000 hours. What they find is, is they find a single layer oxide <coughs> formed at a low pressure, and the dual layer oxide formed at a high pressure, 8 megapascal and um, 29 megapascal. And it's followed by a chrome depleted area into the substance alternate uh, substrate. But if you look, examine it closely, actually the composition for the, for the inner oxide at uh, 8 megapascal and 29 megapascal are also chrome rich. And that's the, uh, the layer actually similar to the 0 0.1, the low pressure exposure. So based on the, the test result, they find that, you know, using superheated steam may provide the qualitatively um, information uh, similar to a testing at the 25 MPA uh, condition. So from chemistry, that 
the change in the chemistry, chemical property is a very drastic at expected as a pseudo critical point. So the um, the SUWR at the encode at radiolysis characteristic is quite different from the current uh, water cool reactor. This is a figure that shows the density variation with the temperature. So you can see that at low pressure, the density vary. They have a sharp drop from the at the um, saturation point. So in that case, the you know, majority of the reactor actually at the density operate at the low density region. I mean the high density region. So it doesn't, except for the accident condition, then or you drop to the low uh, density region in the PWR. But the PWR, you operate actually pass through the uh, saturation point. So from the uh, supercritical uh, SCWR at the 30 MPa, for example, you have to see the variation that you know still have a uh, rapid drop at the density at the pseudocritical point, but it's not a uh, more or less a discontinuous because you don't have interface change. But for the mass deposit and the full the area. You can see it's very low at the low temperature, and then when you reach the pseudocritical point, the deposit mass is drastically increased. And then when you go to high temperature, it's decreased again. So those are the characteristics you know, of, of the material uh, behavior affected by the chemistry of the, um, of the system. So <clears throat> we need to identify an appropriate water chemistry to minimize the corrosion rate stress corrosion cracking, and also the deposit into the fuel cladding or the turbine blade. The, the need for us is to establish a chemistry control strategy. I'll show you the same figure that we showed before in the material, but look at the chemistry control area. So you can see the, in the system, it's only this part is a supercritical. The rest of them is just a low temperature and low pressure region. So in the chemistry here, in the filtering area, to determine what is the, the concentration of impurity enter into the core, and thus does the focus on the uh, on the filtering. So what we propose that you know you can use a full flow condensate polisher like uh, PWR to remove any any impurity from the fuel uh, cladding, and you treat use the oxygen uh, oxy oxygenated treatment for the filtering in this area, and then possibly in geothermal hydrogen addition upstream of the core. This is to control the oxidation of the species in core so that you can minimize the um, activity transport to the turbine or through the, uh, the cladding. So for thermohydraulic, and one of the key difference between the SCWR and the current fleet of reactor is the, 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 the lack of phase strength. Because in the, at the supercritical pressure, the, the coolant is actually act as a single phase. It's no, no boiling, so no phase change. So whatever that, you know, the, um, the credit, the use of the traditional CHF criteria or critical heat flux criteria are no longer valid or appropriate uh, for the SCWR. So the, the limit that we use is always based on the cladding temperature or the fuel temperature as the criteria. So we need to predict that, uh, the, the heat transfer accurately because of the sharp temperature or the, dense, or the property variation along the pseudocritical point. So you can see uh, that this is the figure showed you the density variation, thermal conductivity, specific heat of viscosity and as a function of bulk fluid temperature. So this is a pseudo-critical point in this area. You can see the property drop you know, sharply in this area, but not as sharp as the, uh, like, uh, like this continue when you're phase chain. This is a variation of the density and the viscosity. The specific heat, on the other hand, that you see at the low value, at the low temperature, and then jump up and then increase sharply at the pseudo-critical point. And then after that, it decreases, as in then go to the low value again at, at high temperature. So because of this kind of sharp variation in property, it has a very significant impact to the heat transfer characteristic. So we have, uh, 
we have collected a large amount of experimental data to support the heat transfer calculation. We have a lot of tube data. The majority of tube data actually they come from the the, the fossil power plant uh, experiments. So those are data that you know because the fire tube for the fossil power plant usually bigger, so they may not be applicable directly applicable, but at least that they provide some information to understand the phenomena. And we also collect the uh, data for the three, four, seven rod bundle as subassembly. And at this point, because we're still in a conceptual phase, testing a full scale bundle is uh, considered premature because we're still optimizing the fuel assembly or improving the fuel assembly uh, heat transfer characteristic. But on top of it, we most of the experiment is just operating or testing with a uniform heating or reference cases. We don't have any uh, data for the separate effect. For example, non-uniform power distribution axially or radially, and those are the information we need into the assessment of the heat transfer characteristic to establish the power generation and the safety criteria. This is a sample of the database that we have collected. We have analyzed data, tube data, four rod bundle, three rod bundle, seven rod bundle in water, CO2, carbon dioxide, refrigerant, and in different configurations. So I'm not going to go into detail on the survey, uh, but just show you a, a few figures on the heat transfer experiment that we have done. <coughs> and we have done the, uh, the four rod bundle in, in high pressure water flow. So the flow condition is, is a 25 MPa, 1,000 kilogram per meter square per second flow, and the temperature at 416 degrees Celsius. And the rod itself, they have uh, equipped with a movable thermal couple in the one rod and a fixed thermal couple in the other rod. And this is a, these are the data that without any spacer effect. And this is a comparison of the circumferential heat transfer, the wall temperature measurement that they have. This is a movable thermal couple in a very small uh, angle increment. And those are the fixed thermal couple. You can see that both agree quite well, very well, between the movable and the fixed thermal couple. And that showed uh, that the, um, the rod is, uh, the performance is uh, very good. And in this figure, they compare the, um, <coughs> the the wall temperature measure that uh, between this in the rod with no spacer and the rod with spacer. In general, that what we find that is the rod with spacer usually have a lower temperature in this area as an open uh, symbol, a uh, lower temperature, except when the, the, the spacer is located in that area. Because it, the, the test, the rod itself is direct heated, so in that case, that the, the spacer also introduces heat to the system, and that's the reason why that you have a localized peak at the temperature. But in general, that what we find the spacer is in fact is enhanced the heat transfer. In this case, that they measure the, uh, the free rod bundle in a carbon dioxide flow, and this is the axial or temperature variation with the, uh, in the one of the rod that at the different actual location. And they also compare the, the difference between Greek spacer and the y ref spacer. Again, that <coughs> the y the ref spacer seems to be provide a systematic uh, improvement in uh, heat transfer or lower the wall temperature. But at the, the Greek spacer, they introduce the uh, improvement at heat transfer at the at the grid area, but the improvement actually decreased very fast as the uh, downstream of the grid spacer. From safety, uh, the challenge is you know uh, we have to demonstrate the the safe, safety design effectiveness uh, in the system. We at this point we have collected some of the transient experimental data, but still that we need more data on this area. And the critical part, especially for the pressure transient through the pseudo-critical point. We also have collected a lot, large amount of data for at the supercritical water uh, test or critical flow that will help us to, um, to design the safety relief valve and also the depolarization system and also support the large break local analysis that we use in the safety analysis. 
And because the system is, uh, is uh, have a very strong coupling between the neutronic and fermionic, and is also susceptible to dynamic oscillation, we have collected a large amount of data to look at the uh, stability of the, the flow in the in the system. And one of the challenges that we have is the, to quantify the applicability of the safety analysis tool. And we need data to validate the, the tool because the majority of the, um, the tool have been validated for subcritical condition only. So we need to have uh, integral test data for the, at the supercritical condition to validate this uh, cause. So some of the transient experiment that we have collected so far, for example, in a four rod bundle, and you look at the pressure transient from, uh, from a drop from a supercritical pressure down to subcritical pressure, what we find that is the, the temperature, the cladding temperature or the wall temperature at the rod is actually quite low at the high pressure condition. When you achieve approach the pseudocritical point, the temperature actually increased drastically. And this is similar to the thin boiling condition that at the subcritical region. And we also look at the free rod bundle. They look at the, the this is the power transient simulation. Is basically you drop the, the the power by 15% and then for some time, and then increase it back to the um, the normal condition. You can see that once you drop the uh, the power, the other the system parameter also vary with the, the changes, and then it takes some time for the, the flow, for example, and to stabilize. And the temperature, actually the wall temperature follow quite closely with the changes. And the other test that we have is the, pre the, the, um, the flow transient. This is dropping the flow by 15% and then for some time and then bring it back up. And you can see that the power doesn't, is not affected by the transient it's because it's, com it's stable. And but the pressure oscillated when you drop the flow become, uh, before it becomes stabilized. The wall temperature, for example, in the two cases, it corresponds very closely with the flow variation. So those are the information that we have so far. From physics point of view, the, actually the neutronic design, the effect is both safety, economic, and also sustainability, and proliferation, resistance, and safe security. The coolant change, actually from liquid light to gas light fluid over the core. And then it's affecting the absorption and moderation of the of the uh, the core characteristic. What we see we find is the characteristic actually the physics similar to those of a current fit reactor, except for the difference in geometry, temperature, and property. And you look at the very strong coolant the moderation effect, and then we definitely need to embark on the 3D neutronic or multi coupling. One of the, char the challenges we're facing is the, to establish the accuracy of the physics code for the harder neutron spectrum and the higher fuel temperature and the moderated temperature. And we also need temp uh, uh, physics, uh, the data to validate the physics code. And those are the challenges we have. As I mentioned that, you know, the, we, the, the research and development is uh, based on very strong collaboration between the different group of partners. And the, the collaboration actually allow us to leverage resource and expertise from a different partner to expedite the development. We have a strong collaboration between the Generation 4 in the National Forum, in the system, the steering committee, and also the, um, the project management board. And we also that have a strong the support from the International Atomic Energy Agency who organizes the coordinated uh, research program to involve non chip member states into, uh, into the in the development. And we also establish a bilateral agreement between different groups. And before, for example, the, the China has signed a project arrangement, we have bilateral agreement between EU and China and Canada and China to work together on the common uh, interest. And we have uh, a lot of uh, uh, exchange uh, of information in the international symposium on the SWR. We just complete the eighth symposium now in Chengdu, China, and we always have a strong participation from the uh, from the chip 
and non-GIP member in the symposium. The under GIP we also organize the information exchange meeting between different partners to help us to um, to disseminate any information between partners. And as I mentioned, the IAEA has a coordinated research project and technical meeting, and that's also the venue for us to interact with um, non-GIP partner in the SC supercritical water uh, heat transfer or material development. So is, uh, after the, the, is this, in summary, the, we have several the SCWL design concept and both the pressure tube type and the pressure vessel type. We have a direct thermal cycle that can simplify the, the, uh, the concept design and also reduce cost. The, the thermal power generated from 1600 uh, megawatt for the uh, fast reactor in the Japan uh, concept to around 4,000 megawatt and, uh, uh, for the other con thermal concept. And the thermal efficiency is high at, higher than 43%, as high as 48%. We have a thermal spectrum, fast spectrum, and mixed spectrum concept. And the, we use the light water and heavy water moderator for the thermal spectrum and a solid moderator for the blanket field for the fast spectrum. And we see that there's some similarity between the, um, the thermal spectrum core concept now emerge. And <clears throat> for example, the Canadian, the pressure tube the, um, reactor using the uh, inner panel similar to the vessel vessel, but it's not in the active zone. <clears throat> and then the subdivision of the, the core into a different zone that is similar to a pressure channel or pressure tube. So those are the, uh, the cases that we have emerging. We have still have a design challenge, and we identify them. Some have been resolved, and others are still being addressed. I think this concludes my presentation. So I provide some reference at the back of the uh, presentation. Feel free to, uh, to look at them. And thank you for your attention. Thank you, Lawrence. Uh, if you have questions for today's presenter, go ahead, please, now, and type them in the uh, Q&A chat pod. And while those questions are coming in, we'll give you a sneak peek at the upcoming presentations. Um, on the 27th of April, a presentation by Professor Peterson with UC Berkeley on fluoride salt-cooled high-temperature reactors. Uh, the 23rd of May, a molten salt reactor presentation by Dr. Elisa Merle with uh, CEA in France. And in June, on the 20th, a lead fast reactor presentation by Professor Craig Smith with the U.S. Naval Graduate School. So I do see some questions. Um, Lawrence, do you see yep. the? I said I, OK. And the first question is, you mentioned that HCWL can be applied also for coal generation for hydrogen production. Uh, which way can be produce hydrogen? Produce hydrogen when I cannot see the whole thing. That's a problem. There is a on the right hand side of your chat box. There should be a um, scroll bar that'll help you move down. Yeah. Okay. Uh, anyway, so I'll go to the seventeen. So sorry, already. In the hydrogen production, because of the high temperature coming out and from the, uh, the turbine, we can use the copper chlorine cycle uh, to, for hydrogen production. Is that OK? This is uh, by adopting the, higher, the copper chlorine cycle, which require only the low temperature as compared to the um, hydrogen sulfide cycle. So that's the cycle that we are planning to use. OK, next one. Uh, slide just say that a simplified PSA indicating the pressure tube type. The core had a core temperature that is at least an order lower than that. What? Sorry, I still can't see the question. It says, are you reading the one from um, Craig Smith? 
slide 26 states that a simplified PSA indicates that the PT type SCWR has a core damage probability that is at least an order of magnitude lower than the other reactor systems. What are the other reactor systems that this refers to? Oh, do we refer to the, um, <coughs> the current fleet of reactor? Okay, this is the current fleet of reactor comparison. Uh, how would, okay, <coughs> we got, uh, how would pressure tube SCWL fuel cores be affected if UO2 were used instead of put thorium? Uh, good question. We did a comparison between the UO2 and put thorium as well, and the UO2 is slightly lower, but it's not, uh, not a drastically changes, but uh, the uncertainty is smaller, so that is the difference. Uh, good question. <coughs> and the next one, what are the advantages for Canada SCWR to use heavy water? For thinking about, <coughs> uh, okay, being able to use natural uranium fuel for or non-enriched uranium fuel. Yeah, uh, we cannot use the natural uranium fuel for, for this case. And the advantage is actually is the uh, neutron economy. We bring in the heavy water, actually that uh, uh, help us on the neutron economy. And we can also use light water, but you know, we find that heavy water is, um, is better. And so that we can use uh, lead enrichment, and then we can uh, use uh, also thorium as well. Uh, next one. Interesting presenter. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Mark. Uh, on a scheduling note, please clarify that the gym is scheduled for June 12, not June 20. Okay. <laughs> Uh, that's for Berta. Yep, I apologize. <laughs> Thanks, Craig. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Michael. Slide show. Can you explain more than this cycle on Canadian SSWL? Slide show. Okay. Oh. This is slide 12. Can you explain more the heat cycle on Canadian SCWR? Uh, Canadian SCWR is here. So let me grab this thing. So what you have in here that the fuel, this is the, um, the coolant coming in and through the nozzle in here acting at an orifice, you adjust the orifice and then uh, to match the flow that coming, the match the power. So the flow that is coming in the outside getting to the center in the through this, uh, again another set of nozzle. So through this come down and then through the center area in this area and then reverse the direction and then coming up through the gap, then like the, the, this is a fuel rod in this area. And then passing through the, this area, and then this is the, um, the steam coming up, and then go to the um, outlet header. So if this is the case that <coughs> the pressure tube is here, and the fuel itself, you have an insulator, and then this is a fuel rod. So the fuel rod, so the flow, in that flow coming down, the blue area, the tube, and then reverse at the bottom, and then coming up through the fuel rod. Hope that clarified the, um, the heat cycle on the, the thing. And on slide even, what does the purple circle only denote 8,000 ppd? Okay, slide 21st. Is that the, the figure, slide 24, 21? Uh, DBP, 
thousand BPP. Sorry, I don't find this uh, eight thousand BPP in here. Copin, I on slide twenty one, the purple circle. I don't understand the eight thousand BPP. Sorry. Why volume is suitable for SCWR? Um, another question, why volume is suitable for SCWR? Uh, volume is suitable for uh, pressurized heavy water reactor and also suitable for SCWR. Uh, I don't understand the question. <laughs> is volume is kind of few. The it's it's fertile, so you need to have uh, uh, either uh, UO2, enriched UO2, or 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 reactor grade plutonium to start the, the process. And I guess you know if you have enough, then the. Um, Neutron, it will start the um, the process, and it's suitable. And we did the, the calculation already. is um, is applicable for the SCWR. Thank you. Slide thirty first. Oh, slide thirty one. That's the one with the circle, right? Oh, okay. Oh, those are the the circle is a, a different. Uh, Oxygen, I think, repeat on you know oxygen uh, level in the in the autoclave that they test. It's a different condition that they introduce. So that's what the part per billion. Okay, yeah, I hope that answers the question. It's a different condition that they introduce into the. Um, into the autoclave. Thank you. Uh, I don't see any more questions, so. That looks I, like that looks like that is the end of the um, the questions, at least so far. I will. I will go ahead and make note of the correction again in June. Um, the presentation on uh, lead fast reactors is scheduled for the 12th of June, uh, not the 20th. I apologize for that typo. Thank you, Mohammed, and I really appreciate you guys participating in this webinar. I hope that I provide uh, uh, some information for you to uh, to move on with your research. And if you have any questions, and uh, feel free to drop a line to me, and then. And I hope that we can discuss and continue the, the dialogue. And as I mentioned, that the, the SCWR actually that is work with uh, a collab through collaboration. I hope that we got uh, more partner and more people that uh, working on it so that you can help us to expedite the design. You said that I got another question. You said that the reactor plan for is also finished. So have you developed neutronic? Calculation after the shutdown of reason and its long shutdown period. Well, we developed the plan concept. I think that we still have uh, some lingering uh, uh, work to be done. I, I mentioned this is the concept phase, and uh, we continue working on the um, the startup shutdown and calculation as well. So it, it's still continuing. Thank you, Natura. Okay. Well, thank you again, uh, Dr. Lung. It's very um, been a pleasure working with you through this webinar presentation um, and getting ready for it. I appreciate the efforts to put together the slides. Um, Thanks to everyone else who's attended. Uh, your, present, your attendance makes these uh, very worthwhile, and your interaction during the Q&A is, 
is um, always appreciated. Amanda, thanks for your help on the back end. Um, and Patricia, thank you for your leadership through the Education and Training Task Force and putting these uh, presenters, getting the people gathered to, to do these presentations, of course, is always very appreciated. I guess with that, we will conclude um, and wish everyone a, a good day.